So thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm going to speak uh, from two perspectives. One is from the perspective of a clinician who actually does risk assessment in the clinic and from some of the work that we've done trying to make meaning of um, genetic testing in um, high-risk populations. So um, one of the areas that uh, sort of got me very interested in uh, risk prediction is really because um, uh, Dr. Rowley basically changed the way we treat leukemia by using chromosomes and chromosomal alterations in leukemia to do risk-adapted treatments. So for those of us in oncology, we've been very used to using risk prediction in prognosis. And uh, in 1997, when ASCO uh, uh, really jumped on the idea of um, ASCO Cancer Genetics Task Force, you know, making oncologists adopt genetics in clinical practice, it was because you know, Henry Lynch was taking families and pedigrees to uh, oncology meetings and telling us that genetics was important in oncology care. So um, I just really want to acknowledge my mentors, Dr. Gollum, and of course my colleagues, peer group, that have really thought about how we would use genetics in clinical cancer care, and all of you who are not in um, oncology will recognize Henry Lynch, um, who, I, as far as I'm concerned, really um, um, led this field, and uh, Ken Offit, and Judy Garber, and, and, and Steve Nerod. And so the question that we've been asking and we've been interested in, and I was really excited when this paper was published in the New England Journal in 1996, uh, showing a clear distinction between a germline uh, BRCA1 mutation carrier and, uh, and controls in terms of um, 47 patients uh, risk stratification based on platinum therapy. And I was, you know, so excited that I wrote this um, editorial in the New England Journal based on a, a basic understanding of how BRCA1 works, that, you know, the only reason why people aren't getting tested is either because they have no money or they're ignorant of the benefit of genetic testing. And why did I write that? Because people actually came to my clinic and wrote checks to get BRCA1 tested before the test was available, before the genetics community accepted that we could test individual because patients really wanted to know what was going on in their family. And on the other side, the people who, even when you saw an extended family history and you told them, we need to get you into research and be tested, why my patients on the south side of Chicago, who at that time said they were not really ready to be burdened by the burden of genetic testing without actionability. And so I had been really thinking about what will it take us to actually uh, have inclusiveness in genetics research, and what will it take to actually uh, promote health equity by using genomics uh, because you're born with your genes, and your genes are your genes. So how do we really establish uh, a way to get this going? So circle back 20 years later, uh, here's what I get in my clinic, because not only do we have the ability to do uh, genetic testing for high-risk alleles now in the clinic, we also now have uh, companies that will market polygenic risk score uh, for you based on um, uh, uh, GWAS data. And they will come with a caveat that this only applies to women of European ancestry. And so frequently my genetic counselor will have to decide whether they send a genetic test out or not and what it's just very complicated. So the question is, how do we use this and how do we move forward? So I've been thinking about um, heterogeneity in breast cancer 
and population genetics ever since BRCA1 was identified because BRCA1 actually pointed out to the fact that we have different patterns of gene expression. For those of you who have used TCGA data, you know we now have lots and lots of data, not only on um, somatic mutation, copy number variation, methylation, microRNA, and that we can partition uh, breast cancer into multiple subtypes. Because we could do that in breast cancer, it's also been done pan cancer with 10,000 cancer genomes or cancer uh, gene expression uh, profiles in the Cancer Genome Atlas. And so in oncology, this is what's driving drug development. This is what's driving all that we do. And um, I put this uh, paper in because as soon as we r could do gene expression profiling, we also knew that methylation, epigenetic changes, was going to actually really contribute to uh, 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 tumor progression. And I know that during this uh, uh, session, we're going to be thinking about epi epigenetics. And what I learned from this uh, particular paper was that when we were able to use uh, chromosome in situ hybridization, when we were able to measure BRCA1 uh, RNA expression, we know for sure that there's some patients whose first event is a BRCA1 methylation, so that in, in effect, you either methylated your DNA uh, in the tumor or you, were, you had inherited mutation. And we saw um, a number of African-American patients in, a, in this cohort who had methylation of BRCA1 as an initial event. So then the question is, um, how do you integrate uh, lifestyle and other polygenic or, or multiple risk factors into uh, risk stratification. Based on the work that was really done, looking at different patterns of expression, which really became possible because we had the BRCA1 mutation carriers as sort of uh, uh, a, a well-defined phenotype. Uh, we then really started looking at the population uh, uh, um, uh, rates of different subtypes of breast cancer. So when you look at this data, uh, you know that breast cancer, as we've, and as with all complex diseases, we frequently think about them as something that happens as you get older. So age was always the determining factor for recommending screening, for recommending interventions. But the minute we were able to actually look at uh, the different subtypes of breast cancer, then we started really seeing that, well, the predominant breast cancer that we had all been studying was the age-related uh, ER-positive breast cancer in older white women. And with, with any cohort you look at, all we have in the medical literature is what obtains to white women as they get older, or white men as they get, get older. And by really beginning to do subtype analysis, we saw that, in fact, triple negative breast cancer or ER negative breast cancer, there's a bimodal pattern of inheritance, a pattern of uh, um, uh, incidence, and that uh, African ancestry groups had the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer at a very uh, early age. And when you look at other uh, uh, breast cancer subtypes, you don't see that. But the reason why we had these four subtypes was because these were the subtypes that we had treatments for in oncology. I bet the more treatments we have, the more uh, actionable somatic mutations we have, the more uh, uh, subtypes of breast cancer or different cancers we're going to have. So looking at the uh, most important subtype, uh, triple negative breast cancer. We then ask the question about um, whether there are genotype uh, uh, population differences in genotypes. Because for a clinician like me, it's not so much um, whether we want to um, only find uh, people in the population who are unaffected and tailor screening and risk uh, reduction strategies. We also know that cancer is a disease that in those days, we used to say this is a death sentence, and people come to you looking for uh, new therapies. And so we were really interested in finding targeted treatment options. 
because the first kinds of uh, genetic testing that you're going to see in oncology are cancer patients pushing you for uh, new treatments. So lots of treatment, uh, 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 um, lots of uh, cancer patients got tested and we were able to move this forward. And then the question is, do we now get to population uh, risk stratification because we can, in fact, intervene in unaffected uh, patients? And the important thing is, would risk assessment actually also get us to the point where we may identify those not at increased risk? This was profound because in the past, before having ability to do risk stratification, uh, based on your family history, women made decisions, people had prophylactic surgery, and we were concerned that we were going to do more harm than was than good. And, uh, and so we spent a lot of the last 10 to 20 years really making sure that we first did no harm. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that, in fact, uh, there were many more genes that were uh, highly penetrant, and then we spent a lot of time also looking at risk alleles using single nucleotide polymorphisms. What I want to uh, share with you is sort of what we learned uh, in non-European uh, ancestry groups doing BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing. Uh, what we did was uh, to establish uh, a, co uh, a case control study in Nigeria, in Cameroon, and in Uganda. And the idea behind our study was that we knew that the lifestyle, the epidemiologic risk factors in these countries were going to be vastly different from the lifestyle factors in uh, African Americans because basically everything that we knew about uh, risk factors in the US, including BMI, height, and alcohol consumption, when we went across um, uh, uh, two centers in Nigeria, we actually saw differences. When we looked at parity across uh, two centers, the uh, two cities in, in Lagos, they were uh, different. And then by the time we actually went to Cameroon and Uganda, we also saw that, in fact, uh, many of these um, risk factors that have been well studied in the US were really not applicable to the African cohort. Then we asked about um, GWAS, um, because this, the cohort was actually put together to do genome-wide association studies and pool data with um, individuals of African ancestry. And the first thing you're going to find is that we couldn't rec replicate anything that was uh, any GWAS index variants found in whites and Asians, and you all know about that. We also found flip-flop phenomenon where risk alleles might be uh, a risk allele in one population and it's protective in the other population. So every way we looked at it, it was just not possible to replicate any of the findings from GYs in Africa, in, uh, from whites in our African ancestry cohort. Then we pulled data with the AMBA cons consortium, the African American Breast Cancer Studies, and tried to do uh, meta-analysis and uh, um, pull GWAS. We got one hit, and, um, and I'm sure Muncie is going to talk to you a lot more about some of the uh, new uh, work that's ongoing now to redo genome-wide association studies using African ancestry groups. But because of the uh, question of linkage disequilibrium and short LDs in African genomes, because our reference genomes actually do not uh, have full representation of African genomes, we have constantly been surprised at how um, unapplicable uh, un everything that's been discovered in European ancestry groups is to uh, predominantly African ancestry groups. So in talking about uh, genetic justice, in talking about health equity, uh, it becomes challenging for us to actually think about what we want to do. So we started really thinking about uh, patients who come to us in the clinic and trying to figure out how we can begin to take the 
uh, the high risk alleles and do some interventions in the clinic. So this is a, a cohort of nearly 300 African American breast cancer patients. And when you test them with a panel, you see that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the most important uh, uh, genes that sort of explain their cancer. Of course, it is selected cohort, but when you look at triple negative breast cancer patients, 25% of them had um, actionable mutations. And by the time you have breast and ovarian cancer, it's sort of striking you uh, there. A lot of them have mutations. So then we went on to um, do the most important experiment, very expensive experiment that probably nobody has done. Uh, we did uh, 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls unselected from Ibadan, Nigeria. And what we wanted to do was what is the proportion of patients who have symptomatic breast cancer in a low resource setting where there's no screening and what proportion of these patients have damaging mutations in highly penetrant breast cancer susceptibility genes. And what we found was very high rates of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And then of course, you see the tail of all the other genes. And um, so 14.7% of the uh, patients in Nigeria who were part of this uh, 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 study had pathogenic loss of function germline mutations. We've also done uh, 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 germline, uh, somatic mutation testing similar to the TCGA. And what we found is in that tumor testing, 7% of the Nigerian tumors had BRCA2 mutation, 4.1 uh, with uh, uh, BRCA1 and PALB2. So when you look at this, you can see clearly that in this African ancestry group, with young onset cancer, there was enrichment for highly uh, penetrant mutations in breast cancer susceptibility genes. Now, because of the diversity across African populations, these mutations uh, that we found in BRCA1 and 2 were heterogeneous. You're not gonna find them just doing uh, sort of uh, recurring mutations. Each one tended to have their own unique mutation. And what we learned uh, was actually that what we had been accustomed to, which was to use family history or to use age of onset to ascertain these cases was wrong because majority of individuals who actually had uh, pathogenic mutations identified had no family history, whether they were under the age of 50 or they were over the age of 50 because they did not have the associated risk factors that we had been looking for, they were enriched for actually uh, heritable factors and BRC1 and 2 happened to be the most dominant that we could find. Having said that, there were still uh, individuals who had family history and we had the mutations. So the question then that we started asking ourselves is, okay, can we use uh, uh, mutation signatures? Because that's really the next uh, frontier in cancer geno genomic studies. And could we begin to answer questions regarding racial ethnic disparities in breast cancer? And so this, is, uh, this paper was, is published because it's a very expensive experiment. We didn't have a lot of, uh, we couldn't sequence a lot of uh, uh, Nigerian samples, but we were able to actually compare um, uh, uh, 129 Nigerian tumor normal pairs with what was possible in TCGA. And it turns out that uh, for um, our cohort, we actually had, we have more Nigerian genome sequence now than is in TCGA, and that allowed us to actually begin to ask questions about uh, mutation signatures. So the bottom line is what we found using immunohistochemistry, what we found uh, using population-based data is that if you go from African ancestry in Nigeria all the way to TCGA, to SEER, to YTCGA, to YTSEER, you're gonna see a, a sort of a shift in who gets triple negative breast cancer, which is in the uh, purple, and who gets your predominant homoreceptor positive breast cancer. So whenever we're talking about risk prediction now in breast cancer, it's no longer really sufficient for us to say, 
breast cancer because you've got to define what breast cancer you're talking about. And for non-white populations, uh, the di population distribution is very different. The age distribution is very different. And as such, one size cannot fit all in terms of developing PRS scores. So what we found with our, our tumor sequencing is that, of course, with the Nigerian cohort, lots of P53 mutations, and then there's sort of a tail of different genes that are somatically mutated. What we were able to show, uh, looking at um, even hormone receptor positive versus hormone receptor negative breast cancer, is that the um, the signature that sort of all of us have been sort of tracking once we found uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which is the homologous recombination deficiency signature, was actually quite uh, enriched in both ER negative and, and uh, homoreceptor positive breast cancer from Nigeria. And in summarizing the, the paper, we showed that there was really very, uh, uh, a few things that were really important, which is the Apobex signature that is much more prevalent in, in uh, older white women, uh, was really uh, uh, separating uh, the Nigerian cohort from the TCGA cohort. We saw more BRCA1 and 2 mutations associated with increased HRD. Nigerians in general had increased HRD, and then Nigerian and black cohorts had lower Apobec C to T transition than whites. And this is getting us really to etiology. And if we're gonna think about risk prediction and we're gonna think about etiology, we have to put both geography, place, and exposure in time, uh, in the context. So going from um, sort of looking at this uh, 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 risk stratification, we found that the more, um, sorry, <laughs> this is a little bit. Uh -huh. So we found that we could do basically stratification into two where this is the proportion where you see older white women having pic 3 ca and uh, uh, your lobular and HER2 enriched breast cancer and uh, increasing mutation load. And then in the uh, Nigerians and HRD signature proportion, you have your P53 mutations, you have your BRCA1 and 2 mutations, hormone receptor negative, HER2 negative and rich, and then you see we saw increasing copy number segmentation. And uh, this was only possible because we were able to go from Nigeria to the US and compare across African genomes. Now, having seen that, uh, we also know that there are lots of somatic uh, mutation work that's going on across different Asian countries. And this is uh, really uh, data from uh, Sun Yong from Malaysia, where they also see uh, differences in proportions with P53 mutations and proportions uh, with uh, uh, different uh, 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 subtypes based on Korea, uh, the database from Korea, from Malaysia, and then Metabric, which is a targeted sequencing database, and then uh, Nigeria and TCG uh, uh, data set. So whenever we're talking about risk prediction, we cannot forget the fact that populations are different, uh, uh, genomes are different, and we have to really figure out how we uh, integrate all of this. So to summarize, for me, um, what we're looking for is really how do we screen and what do we use PRS scores for? And if there are no PRS scores and we want to uh, do population-based uh, ascertainment, uh, there's been discussions about should we use age 45 for African Americans to begin screening? Should we, you know, whether you look at colon cancer, whether you, you look at prostate cancer, these are all sort of complex disorders that we're trying uh, to, uh, to, to work on to reduce disparities. So for breast cancer, uh, what we have found is that because African Americans are more likely to have aggressive hormone receptor negative or triple negative breast cancer, um, we cannot actually uh, uh, do age-based screening anymore because if you do age-based screening, whether you do your cutoff at 40 or you do your cutoff at 50, you're going to miss a large segment 
of the uh, population that actually have risk of early onset breast cancer. So we also know that um, be, with uh, uh, young onset breast cancer also comes the challenge of having very dense breast. And we know that uh, breast density is a, uh, is a trait that lots of people are trying to develop polygenic risk score to be able to uh, to uh, evaluate in the population. So we did this study looking at, uh, and this has been published now, looking at MRI to pick up breast cancer. And we learned something because what we learned is that even though we had assumed that breast cancer sort of, you know, went in a, st a systematic uh, fashion from being DCIS to invasive breast cancer, we found that uh, for BRCA1 mutation carriers, they developed node positive uh, aggressive breast cancer within getting MRI every year. We wanted to do screen every six months and we were able to actually downgrade when we got these cancers. And you could see this uh, um, uh, small cancer uh, by screening every six months. And so in the editorial that accomplished our paper, the question is more is more, semi-annual breast MRI screen in BRC1 mutation carriers. But we also know that that's going to be very expensive. And so we can't do everybody in the population this way. But if you're really looking for those aggressive interval cancers that have sort of spoiled all of our prevention and, uh, and, and, and screening uh, recommendations, then we have to do something different. What we found was that adding mammogram to MRI didn't actually add much more to it, and that maybe MRI alone might be sufficient. But the thing is, when you're introducing a new technology in the, in the population, people are going to be worried about false positive and false negative. So in the clinic, we're always worried about false doing no harm. And so we actually looked at psychosocial measures for BRCA1 mutation carriers who wanted to get screening. And what we found was that by screening, the quality of life actually improved and there was no anxiety and no depression identified because they were actually in a health maintenance mode. And so being able to do the risk prediction, showing that they were high risk, and then put them on an intervention actually turned out to be quite um, useful because not only did we find their cancers early, we also showed that we were able to actually advance uh, 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 their health because they 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 maintained uh, um, uh, uh, they they were able to, they they were ad they adhered to our screening recommendations and we picked up the cancer uh, with a mean size of six millimeters. So for us, uh, the question really is that in non-African and non-European populations, this is a review we put into. Uh, the pop, uh, into the uh, discussion in 2015 that one size doesn't fit all. The more we do genomic studies that's really heavily populated by European ancestry groups, we will continue to widen the racial disparities gap. So for, uh, uh, for us to really promote health equity in breast cancer, what we're really looking for are better tools that can allow us to do population risk stratification. So the wisdom study, for those of you who don't know about the wisdom study, this study will try to look at 100,000 participants going to get a mammogram. Unfortunately, it's only women uh, ages 40 to 75 are eligible. And right now, we're trying to put uh, PRS into this screening study, and we still don't have one to include non-European uh, ancestry group. But we will hopefully uh, get some things to put into this clinical trial. In the meantime, what we also found was that uh, most of the genetic testing uh, facilities actually are not where patients who could benefit from geno genomic analysis are. You know, all of us are in academic medical uh, centers, and we refer patients to go for genetic testing. And they're not going to go because they just don't have the time and they don't have the resources. And so all of this that get us to uh, uh, screening, whether we put uh, screening or genomic testing in uh, mammography size, in OBGI, in PCP, and then get referral 
I think we all have to really begin to think about how we do this implementation science. So let me uh, end by saying that we actually know a lot now about who is at risk, what's going on. For breast cancer, we now have five drugs. And because of the work that we did in breast cancer, we now have uh, uh, be, uh, PAP inhibitors now approved for pancreatic cancer, for prostate cancer, and now in oncology, everyone wants genetic testing because all these new drugs are available for us. And that happened within 20 years of clinicians saying we're going to do this. So I think that the way this will go forward is really if we engage more clinicians who want to really do preventive oncology, who want to uh, move uh, new models for early detection, and then of course, if we don't have access to treatment, you're not going to have non-European ancestry populations participate in any of the benefits of genomic medicine. So um, let me end by saying, you know, after decades, I've learned that these mutations are even enriched in the poorest uh, communities because we've shown it in Nigeria and across the African diaspora. And the questions that we have remaining is when do we test individuals? How do we test them? When do we intervene? And whether clinicians and genetic counselors will collaborate to provide quality cancer genetic risk assessment services. And I think in the future, prevention and cancer interception trials will depend on a lot of the things that we're developing now. So uh, I have, um, I work with a, uh, an amazing team and I've been able to um, collaborate across uh, the African diaspora to do this work. So, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we took the full and then some 30 minutes. Um, so, so if you can hold your questions and and have them for the discussion section, I'm sure that there are several that we would like to raise. Uh, but I don't want to keep people from their break. So, um, so if you don't mind, uh, we'll go on to the break. Then we're about five minutes behind. So please be back at 10:45. We'll start promptly then with uh, introductions of those who just arrived. 